Thank you. Apologies to the members. We couldn't get in there. The next item of business is debate on motion 5282 in the name of Nicola Sturgeon on child tax credit cuts. I would invite all members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak buttons now. Anna Corlin, First Minister, to speak to and move the motion. Presiding officer, I begin by moving the motion in my name. Last Thursday, together with Kezia Dugdale, Willie Rennie, Patrick Harvey and many MSPs from across this chamber, I attended the demonstration against the REAP clause which took place outside this building. At that demonstration, Sandy Brindley of REAP Crisis Scotland said, the opposition to the REAP clause is not about party politics, it is about basic human rights. And I agree very much with that. Of course, the REAP clause has come about because of the two-child cap introduced three weeks ago by the UK government. That cap means that child tax credits and universal credit will only be paid for two children in each family. Now, I'll talk about the rate clause in due course, but it is worth noting that the policy intention of these changes, not an inadvertent consequence, but the intention behind them is to reduce the income of low-wage families with children. And the Institute of Fiscal Studies has set out the stark reality of that. 600,000 households across the UK will be 2,500 pounds a year worse off. Another 300,000 households, those with four or more children, will on average be 7,000 pounds a year worse off. Uh, now, the Health Secretary received a letter today from the Department of Work and Pensions, uh, and it says that the reform is to ensure that people in benefits have to make the same choices as those supporting themselves through work. But that really misses the point, does it not, that around two thirds of these families that will be affected by this policy are working households. They are people who are already participating in the labour market, but on low incomes. And the UK government, therefore, seems to be directly targeting people that it claims to want to help. Now, it's also important to note that these changes are part of a much bigger picture. In total, by 2022, approximately £1 billion a year will have been cut from social security spending in Scotland. Only one-fifth of that is the result of the changes that took effect this month. For the past seven years, this Westminster government has systematically reduced vital social security safety nets. For example, by freezing the work allowance, cutting support for housing, and cutting the income of people with disabilities. And let's just reflect on some of the consequences those decisions have had. Sick and disabled people have seen their incomes reduced by around £30 pounds a week due to cuts in employment and support allowance. Every week right now, around 800 motability vehicles are being removed from disabled people across the UK as a result of changes to personal independence payments. A fact that makes Ruth Davidson's decision yesterday to pose for photographs sitting on a mobility scooter all the more insulting to every disabled person who has lost Young people aged 18 to 21 have also had their financial help with housing costs removed and bereavement payments and widowed parents' allowance have been cut. And of course, more than 70,000 households in Scotland, but for our action, would have been hit by the bedroom tax. More than 80% of those households have at least one adult who is disabled. And that's one reason why the UN has described the UK government's welfare cuts as discriminatory and a systematic violation of disabled people's rights. How shocking is that? The United Nations describing the attack on disabled people's benefits as a systematic violation of their rights. Now, inevitably, these cuts disproportionately affect families on low incomes, those who most need support and assistance. And there is overwhelming evidence that they also disproportionately affect women. As the Women's Budget Group has noted, five-sixths of these cuts that the UK government is making to social security and tax credits will come from women's incomes. And it's worth just repeating that. Five-sixths of the impact of these cuts are being borne by women. No government, surely, with a genuine concern for those who just about manage and the women who so often have the responsibility of holding these households together could ever have chosen to reduce the deficit in this way. So the two-child cap on tax credits is in some senses unsurprising, though deeply regrettable, because it is the sort of policy that we have, yes, 
Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful <coughs> to the First Minister for taking the intervention. Is she surprised to learn that this is in fact the second time that the Conservatives have sought to introduce this policy after they were successfully blocked from so doing in the last Parliament? And does she agree with me that this is yet further evidence that the Conservatives have gone too far? First Minister. Uh, no, I'm not surprised uh, to, to hear that because I know that. And I think while I oppose many of these benefit cuts, I think this one, and particularly the rate clause that flows from it, is uh, definitely going too far in the wrong direction. Uh, but it is the sort of policy we have come to expect from this government. But the implications of this policy, as the rate clause so vividly illustrates, are truly abhorrent. You know, the very need to provide an exemption from the two-child cap for women who have been raped shows the callousness of these cuts in the first place. The rape clause is wrong in principle. You know, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, said just at the end of last week that because of this policy, there is a clear risk of the re-traumatisation of rape survivors. No woman, no woman anywhere should have to prove that she has been raped in order to get tax credits for her child. And I actually can't believe that in 2017, I am having to stand up in the Scottish Parliament and make that argument. But this, this policy isn't just immoral, although it definitely is, it's also unworkable in practice. The proposal for third party verification puts an unacceptable burden on health workers and rape crisis centres, as well as on officials from the Department of Work and Pensions. Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, NHS Scotland and many others quite rightly have refused to collude with this clause. And that's one of the reasons why, although it has now passed into law, no one, no one in the UK government is able to explain how it will work in practice. So many basic questions are still completely unanswered. What burden of proof is required? How will the claim be verified and recorded? And how can this process possibly take place without the woman fearing that it will be hugely stigmatising for her and her child? And I would ask Ruth Davidson today not to dodge these detailed questions, but to do what no one has done thus far and to answer these questions. And as she does so, I would ask her to imagine the trauma for any mother already a victim of rape who has to go through such a process. Imagine having to report the most personal and painful information imaginable, then having to go through a process of verification and having that information recorded for years as a condition of one of your financial lifelines. Imagine all of that, because the moment you do, the moment anyone considers all of that, must surely be the moment that the sheer inhumanity of this policy becomes clear. Of course, the Tories' argument today is going to be that we should just ignore the inhumanity of this, that we should just put up with whatever callous cuts the UK government wants to introduce. According to the Tories, instead of arguing for the repeal of policies like the rape clause on grounds of principle and common humanity, the Scottish government should just apply some sticking plaster. And I want to address that ridiculous argument head on today. Firstly, let's be clear about this. The Scottish government cannot abolish the two-child cap or the rape clause. We do not have the legal power to do so. And given the complexity of tax credits and universal credit, trying to mitigate the impact of these cuts would be significantly more complex than simply compensating people for the bedroom tax. But that's not the only issue. The real issue here is the financial impact of mitigation on other services. You see, and this is a key point, when the UK government makes these cuts, they don't pass Scotland's share of the savings on to the Scottish Government. If they did, we could make our own choices, whether to reverse the cut or follow the UK Government in spending the money elsewhere. But the UK Government keeps the money from those savings. So any decision by this Government to mitigate one of these cuts involves taking money that is already allocated to schools, to hospitals and to other services. And of course, notwithstanding that, we have mitigated where we can. We shouldn't have to, but we have. Since 2013, this government has spent £350 million mitigating the bedroom tax. And where we control benefits, we do make our own choices. So we won't, for example, apply the two-child cap in our council tax reduction scheme. But we simply cannot accept 
a situation where the Tories can implement whatever heartless cut they want to, and the only answer is for the Scottish Government to take money from elsewhere to plug the gap. Because where does that end? If we accept that argument, there would be nothing to stop the Tories deciding to no longer pay any benefits for people in Scotland, pocket the savings and look to the Scottish Government to step in. It is a ridiculous and unsustainable yeah. argument. So let me, say, let me say this to the Tories today. If you think that the Scottish Parliament is better placed to take these decisions, and I certainly agree with that, then let's forget the sticking plaster approach. Let's devolve control of tax credits and universal credit, and let's devolve the budgets that go with them, and then let us make our own decisions in this Parliament. The fact of the matter is, the only appropriate mitigation here is for the UK Government to abandon the two-child cap, which then renders the rate clause unnecessary. Just as it reversed cuts to tax credits two years ago in the face of mounting protests, it should ditch these policies now. They are unacceptable and they are unworkable. And let me make this clear as well. They are unacceptable and unworkable, not just in Scotland. They are unacceptable and unworkable right across the UK. Now, the Tories, the Tories here had a choice on this issue, a choice of standing up for what is right or simply being a mouthpiece for the UK government in defending the indefensible. The fact that they have chosen the latter, I think, is to their shame. And it does prove that if Scotland is looking for strong voices to protect all that we hold dear, then the last place they should ever look is to the Scottish Conservative Party. Presiding officer, I said at the start of this speech that this is not fundamentally an issue of party politics. It is an issue of human rights and morality. The overwhelming consensus in this chamber demonstrates that fact. Today's vote gives all of us an opportunity to reaffirm that, uh, to reaffirm that despite the differences we have on so many issues, we all share a basic belief in social justice and we all recognise the importance of humanity, dignity and equality in our social security system. And by doing that, we can add our voice as a parliament, as Scotland's national parliament, to an outcry against the two-child policy and the rape clause that I hope will grow right across the UK. We can take a clear stand against a policy which I would argue has no place in any civilised society. And we can reaffirm this chamber's commitment to progressive values. Presiding officer, for all of these reasons, I urge everyone across this chamber to, su to support today's motion in my name.